everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you today to talk about data science in radiology and imaging informatics. My name is Tessa Cook. I'm a radiologist and informaticist at the University of Pennsylvania. I have some disclosures, mostly related to leadership roles that I hold in a variety of radiology organizations, some grant funding, and some departmental vendor agreements related to AI research. So you might be wondering uh, why a radiologist would need data science. And so I thought it might be helpful to start with a little bit of a background of what a radiologist does in the course of a, a work day. For most of us, we are diagnostic radiologists who spend our time interpreting images in the context of the patient's clinical history and providing information in the form of an interpretation of those images that can be used to guide management, perhaps surgical planning, but many of my colleagues are also in, uh, interventional radiologists who perform image-guided biopsies or sometimes image-guided targeted therapies. But in addition to our specific clinical functions, we also spend a lot of time in consultation, uh, sometimes with other colleagues one-on-one -on -one to guide uh, therapeutics or management of patients that are currently in the hospital uh, or for outpatients who uh, might be awaiting surgical procedures. We also consult with our technologists who are actually performing the uh, imaging and running the equipment directly. And in some cases, even with patients, again, as uh, part of planning the next steps in their care. So for as much time as we spend at the workstation, we also spend a fair bit of time uh, in discussions with other members of the care team and with patients directly. For me, as a cardiovascular radiologist, my role is almost exclusively diagnostic. I don't really do very many procedures. Uh, and my clinical area of interest pretty much covers blood vessels from the lower part of the neck all the way down through the toes. And so any organs that we see along the way are also our responsibility. And that really equates to, in some cases, thousands of images for a single patient multiplied by dozens of patients over the course of a day. So at the end of the day, that is a large quantity of data. So again, you, even after that description, you might still be wondering, so why does a radiologist and why do, does the specialty of radiology need data science? So it turns out that we generate a ton of data in the course of routine clinical practice. Some of it is easy to see, images, obviously, the reports that accompany them, some of it's a little bit harder to capture, measurements, changes over time, particularly in measurements, and then even imaging textures. So things that we can appreciate with the human eye, but not necessarily quantify as easily. So what happens to all of this data after we generate it? Where does it go? How is it processed? How is it analyzed? This is why we need data science. And really, the reason this was the reason for the birth of imaging informatics. So imaging informatics is this marriage of information science, healthcare, and computer science. And it has to do with the practice of processing information, engineering of information systems, and that human-machine interaction and interface for all of the different systems that we interact with over the course of a day to provide clinical care. So it turns out that radiology practice wasn't always this complex and this data heavy. And so you have to go back a little bit of time to actually find out what led to the development and the need for imaging informatics. If you go back in time a few decades, radiology was mostly x-ray and fluoroscopy, which is effectively dynamic x-ray. And even though the images were generated in a digital format, they were then converted to an analog format. And so actually printed out on film, and it was those films that the radiologist would then interact with for their diagnostic process. So early in the 1970s, the first HEDCT was uh, performed on equipment that you can see here that is now in the Science Museum in London. A few years later, the first body CT was performed, and that was when radiologists started to deal with a little bit larger quantities of digital data. So if you look at the late 70s, uh, Dr. Heinz Lemke, who is a computer scientist uh, in Europe, published this paper where he talked about this concept of a medical workstation. So a way that 
radiologists can interact with data without necessarily being in the same physical location where that data was acquired. In other words, in the room uh, just outside the CT scanner where the computer running the scanner was located. And so this was the earliest description of something that ultimately became our PACS, or what we call our Picture Archiving and Communication System. PACS, the official term, was coined uh, back in 1982, but this has really become the workhorse of clinical radiology today. Uh, in many parts of the world, there is no more film that's used in radiology. Uh, and what we use instead is PACS that allows us to connect all the different kinds of imaging equipment that we might use to get the exams off of the equipment into this central archive and then distribute them to the physicians that might be scattered uh, all around the country in some cases who need to be able to view them and interpret them. And so imaging informatics really started with imaging data, but now is so much more than just images. Uh, if you look at this word cloud of what the areas of priority are for imaging informatics fellows who are completing their training today, you'll see the word image is in there, but it's not very big. And there are so many other concepts that are uh, central to the field now. And it's, as a little side note, it's really one of the reasons that when COVID hit last year, that radiology was able to pivot because this infrastructure for remote practice and virtual teaching was already in existence, even though it wasn't heavily used, but it gave us that ability to be able to maintain our practice, even if we weren't physically all present in the same location. So let's talk a little bit more about where data science and imaging informatics come into play in clinical practice, but also in, in other uh, areas of healthcare. Even beyond radiology, medicine today just involves tons of data moving in all directions. And almost everyone now has a, a, an electronic medical record thanks to meaningful use and uh, the health incentive programs from the Office of the National Coordinator that are now a little over a decade old. EMRs were originally designed to drive medical billing, not as patient charts. And so that adaptation kind of came a little bit later. And in part, this is why it's easy to get data, or easier at least, to get data into the medical record but not nearly as intuitive to get it back out. In radiology, since PACS, we've always had tons and tons of data. But as I mentioned earlier, there are actually some data elements that are a little bit harder to capture and use in the course of daily clinical practice. And so there is this burgeoning field of radiomics using those textures within the image, those primary and secondary imaging features, to actually make correlations with diagnosis, with prognosis, with outcomes, to make choices for therapeutic approaches based on these additional imaging characteristics that, although they're not visible to the human eye, represent large quantities of previously untapped data. One of the challenges, though, is that all of this data is not always easy to access in all of the different systems from which we might want to get it. And so this is one of the biggest roles in imaging informatics is making sure that our data moves around correctly. And a, a great way to appreciate this is to actually think about the life cycle of the radiology report. So from the time that someone orders a radiology exam to the issuing of the final interpretation. And you'll notice this is a somewhat of an older figure because there are many paper-based steps in this workflow. If you start all the way on the left at patient registration, before you get all the way around to the end of the process with imaging review and interpretation, you'll notice multiple intermediate steps at which digital data perhaps gets converted to an analog format for transfer to the next phase. And so this was not surprisingly somewhat of an error prone process. And there were those, those transitions were, were chances where data might get corrupted or lost. And so as part of this particular effort, which I'll tell you about more in just a second, the goal was to maintain the consistency of patient information as it transitioned through the care process. Understanding that fewer errors would mean better patient care and increased efficiency. And so now if you, if you study this process, you'll find that in fact there are so many more 
standards that are associated with different aspects with all of these manual analog transitions now becoming electronic transfers of data over, over the course of the care process. And so this is really the reason why the need for standards became very important in radiology because we have so many different kinds of data and so many different transitions of data in the course of routine clinical care. And it became very important that the integrity of that data, the accuracy of that data was preserved. So we needed an, a, a way to communicate effectively, maintain the order of the data, set expectations for what kind of data was coming through, and have a seamless and valid exchange of information. So there are imaging standards and non-imaging standards that we interact with frequently. And there is an organization called uh, IHE. It's an international initiative to, for, called Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise. And the goal of IHE is to help us figure out the best way to apply these standards. And now there's, there's always a, a common joke about standards because sometimes they might conflict. And in order to address that conflict, we just make more standards. And that life cycle sort of repeats itself. But in order to avoid that, we have the work of, of the IHE initiative. And their role is really to guide the development of tools that can increase the interoperability of health systems to improve data exchange and to use established standards, not to create new standards to address these problems, but to use the standards that we actually have. And they provide technical frameworks and they also provide implementation guides to vendors, which is really helpful because then a vendor who builds a solution with one of these implementation guides uh, along the way can actually build something that is interoperable and can interact with other solutions that have been built against the same technical profiles. So we've talked a lot about how much data there is and how it's moving from one system to the next during routine patient care. But what if you want to extract that data for operational analytics or quality improvement or research or innovation? And if any of you have been in a position to have to do that, you may have found it a little bit challenging. And the truth is, because our, our data is stored in different systems, it can be challenging to get at the data that you want for one of these efforts that isn't routine clinical care. And so part of the challenge in that is that different sources of data live in different places. You might want data from the medical record. You might want data from the billing record. You might want imaging data or at least radiology data, whether that's actual images or reports or something else. And oftentimes these data are stored in systems that don't always speak to each other, uh, that may have patient identifiers that have to be reconciled so that you know that you're getting the right data for the right patient. In some cases, the schema for these systems are, are not very evident. And so although you may be able to get the data out, you're not necessarily sure what it means or what is stored where. And for as much informatics as happening behind the scenes during patient care, there's just as much that's happening to support research and development and, and quality improvement. And the other big challenge that we encounter is even though uh, some of the data is structured, for example, laboratory results and things like that, a lot of it is not radiology reports, for example. And even the structured data may not be stored in a way that is easily understood. And so at least in radiology, to address some of these issues, we've had a lot of development. Uh, there's something called the Radlex radiology lexicon, which is, uh, in fact, an ontology of terms, so terms and their hierarchical relationships to one another that have been mapped out not only for terms that we would use in a narrative radiology report in an interpretation of an imaging exam, but also in the naming conventions of those different types of studies. And so there's been a lot of work here to try to create structure in a way where there previously wasn't. In addition, uh, for the actual interpretive process itself, there is an effort underway to create template, uh, templates in a template library to try to standardize the approach to actually interpreting some of these exams. And taking that even one step further, uh, there's an initiative surrounding the development and uh, definition of common data elements. 
So I, measure, I mentioned measurements uh, earlier in the presentation, and the measurements that we typically generate in a radiology report are just stored as part of the narrative. And so if you want to try to extract these to do any kind of analytics, it becomes very challenging. And so the Common Data Elements Initiative is really intended to try to create discrete data elements that store this discrete data, such that you can directly query those specific values without having to extract them from a larger narrative. Now, I'm a radiologist, so in all fairness, I've spoken a lot about radiology. But imaging happens all over a healthcare enterprise, and not all of it is stored in the PACS, which, as I mentioned, is the workhorse of radiology. And so there's a, a, a large initiative around enterprise imaging about being able to store all of the imaging that is done in a distributed healthcare network and deliver it back to the consumers of that data in a fashion that they are most familiar with or most comfortable with but also making that data available across the enterprise to providers and physicians that may not necessarily be in the same physical location. And so not surprisingly, this requires a lot of infrastructure. This requires a lot of governance. This is large quantities of data going back and forth across a system that need to be made accessible, sometimes in different viewers and on different platforms. And so uh, this is an enormous undertaking, but uh, a very valuable one for uh, integrated delivery networks that actually take this on. I would be remiss if I said nothing about artificial intelligence at some point in this presentation. Uh, so I will conclude with uh, a few comments on AI in radiology. Uh, a little over four years ago, there were some dire predictions made about the future of my specialty that suggested that radiologists were like Wiley e. Coyote, who had already cleared the cliff but just hadn't looked down yet. And uh, the more that we started to look at the role of AI in radiology, the more we started to realize that AI was not just going to be uh, replacing all of us, as the prediction would have suggested. Um, if anything, what we've started to discover is that radiology and AI together actually has the potential to help us deliver better patient care. In some ways, it's like the new imaging modality. You know, the generations of radiologists before me had to figure out how to use CT and MRI and molecular imaging for their patients. And my generation and the next generation are going to have to figure out how to use AI to figure out what it does, more importantly, what it doesn't do, and how we can use it safely and effectively as we deliver patient care. There are so many potential use cases for imaging AI. The most common ones that people talk about have to do with pixel-based data, with image data. But in fact, radiology or AI has the potential in radiology to, to do a lot of things that humans are not very good at, like searching through the medical record, making sure that we're consistent. Um, there are a couple of really interesting and exciting potential use cases, for example, being able to predict future development of disease based on the appearance of imaging today. And so this technology is going to be around for a while and it's going to be developing for quite some time. It's really very early. Uh, and so it's going to be exciting to see what we can use it for and how we can use it. One of the criticisms of AI is that it is a little bit of a black box. Data goes in. Some conclusion comes out, and you're not really sure how it all happened. And so explainable AI is a, is a very uh, active field right now in trying to figure out how to make the conclusions and the decision points of an AI model more evident to the end user. Uh, there's a very nice uh, multi-society statement on the ethics of AI and radiology that I was uh, honored to be part of uh, as a co-author. And in this paper, we say that the transparency, interpretability, and explainability are necessary to build patient and provider trust. You know, for us as physicians, this is new technology. We need to be able to understand how it works to make sure that it's working correctly and that it's safe for our patients. The other big consideration is the data. Uh, so much of building a good AI has to do with making sure that the data chosen to train the model represents the problem that you're trying to solve. There are challenges in getting expert label data, how much data is needed to build a good AI model, and a lot of focus on potential bias that can be introduced into AI models intentionally or otherwise. 
We've seen this in non-medical applications of AI where the population to which the AI is applied is not representative of the population with which the, of the data with which the AI was trained. And it can produce some very spurious results because of that. If you extend that to healthcare where you're talking about patients' lives, there are potential real consequences and really devastating consequences. And so we have to be very careful about making sure that we don't introduce bias into these models that we then deploy clinically. Figuring out how to put AI into the workflow is something that we are all actively thinking about and uh, working on right now because no two radiology workflows are the same. It's really not a one-size-fits-all kind of process and therefore you can't just take one AI and say, okay, this is going to work the same way for, for every user. And so this is a real challenge for our colleagues in industry, but, uh, but one they are rising to uh, in trying to figure out how to make this a solution that works for the radiologist rather than the other way around. This is a, a very provocatively titled article in the Journal of the American College of Radiology, but I really like to mention it because I think it's the most honest appraisal of AI right now. Is it a threat? Yes, but is it an opportunity and, and really an opportunity for disruptive innovation? Absolutely. And it's really requiring us to rethink how we deliver care, and, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Because at the end of the day, the goal is not to build a robot radiologist. It's to take those tasks that don't require an MD or don't even require a human and automate them so that the expert physician can, can have these additional tools to supplement what they already are able to do well. And there are so many potential use cases, as I mentioned, and I think really an opportunity to help us be more effective and more efficient by offloading to the computer the things the computer does well to allow the human to do what the human does well. And although it is uh, certainly more exciting to paint this sort of human versus machine adversarial approach to radiology, uh, AI, I think really what we're going to see is a much more collegial and cooperative future where the technology uh, augments the expert physician reader uh, rather than replacing them. And so to conclude, healthcare is, is so different than it was even 20 years ago. You know, we generate more data in routine clinical practice than we ever did before, and radiology contributes a great deal to this. We're, we're heavily dependent as a result on data science and imaging informatics to manage this data, organize it, and analyze it in a meaningful way to guide patient care, but also to advance research and innovation, maintain quality, and teach the next generation, both of radiologists, informaticists, and data scientists. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today, and um, please reach out if, uh, if you have any questions or if I can be of assistance in the future. Thank you so much.